Well, hopefully you have your Bible. Turn to 2 Corinthians. We are in week number 29 of 2 Corinthians. We've been here for a while. Have a little bit longer in the book, and it's been a great book. People ask me often, what's your favorite book of the Bible? And I say the one that I'm currently preaching, and it's so true because I just love the truth that comes out in the Scripture. Kind of give us a little perspective of what's going on because it's almost like a letter within a letter. Chapters 8 and 9, where we've been at, this will be the seventh week, that Paul is rallying the Corinthians to jump on board again with the relief offering for the poor Christians back in Jerusalem. And so Paul uh, is trying to reaffirm their commitment. You remember he had a lot of work to do to kind of rebuild his own authority within the church because they had fallen into sin, the church had gone into chaos, and really they were no longer respecting Paul. And so they kind of took their attention off of this offering they were collecting. And so Paul uses chapters 8 and 9 to speak to this relief offering. And so today we'll close up this section. But I want to go back and begin with verse 6 because this is kind of where we transitioned last week and kind of left this verse with an illustration of a funnel. And verse 6 says of chapter 9, The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, And whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So we had this illustration last week of a funnel, and we said that we need to keep the bottom of the funnel open. And we illustrated by showing that God pours in his blessing. The word that Paul used was literally blessing. He pours in, and then we then distribute and share what God has given to us. But if we get selfish, we get greedy, and we begin to plug up the bottom or limit God's blessings flowing from us, then God will stop pouring into the top. And it was funny, somebody asked me this week, they said, John, it sounds a little bit like the uh, whole prosperity gospel that you've been talking about. God pours in, right, and you pour out. What's that about? Well, today, after I give this next illustration, some of you are going to think for a second here that I've gone straight out heresy on this, right? Because... I think uh, maybe another illustration is this. Uh, Rex is going to, no, sorry, not Rex, um, Bubba, come on up. He told me his real name was Rex, and I called him by his real name, but he likes Bubba. Bubba, come on up here. Bubba's going to hold this boomerang for me. It's, you know, th- this is really manipulation, right, to bring up such a handsome young man up here and have him hold it, right? Somebody get a picture of this guy. But uh, this is Boomerang. He's going to help me in just a minute. Just stand there and hold it for a second, all right? And, and so today's passage, I really want to illustrate that when we are willing to give and to be cheerful about it and give from right heart, it always comes back to us. And so this, this picture that Paul is painting about sowing and reaping, he is saying that when we give out, when we sow, when we share, God returns it back like a boomerang. What, what does a boomerang do? Do you know? Yeah, a boomerang, when you throw it correctly, which I'm not good at throwing it, but I know that you'll probably do better than me, but we're going to give it a shot anyway, all right? Uh, when, you, when you know how to use a boomerang and you throw it, it comes back, all right? This is soft. Tell them, tell them it's soft, all right? So it's not going to hurt anybody. Okay, he's going to throw it back there to his dad, and we're going to see what happens, but chances are it's not going to come back, okay? We're not going to be discouraged by that, but we know a boomerang does come back, so throw that to your dad, all right? Whoa, that's pretty good. All right, fist bump. You, that's yours. You keep it and you practice. You run and get that. That was a good effort right there. And so what is that about? What, is it, what are we talking about here today? Are we talking about prosperity gospel? Or are we talking about God sowing and reaping? What is that? We're going to look at this passage and then let the Bible speak because it's our authority and see what it has to say. So let's read verses 6 through 15. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, He has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Verse 10. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. 
you will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way through which you through uh, which through us will produce thanksgiving for God for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God by their approval of this service they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Let's pray and we'll look at this passage. Father God, we thank you for your word that guides and directs us and ultimately points us to Jesus. And God, I pray today as we reflect upon these words uh, of our stewardship of giving, of, of what you've given to us to be a steward over, God. I pray you'll guide us and lead us. God, I pray for those who have uh, maybe been indoctrinated in the past on a certain type of prosperity gospel today, today. May your scripture give them clarity on what exactly you're saying and not saying in this passage. God, I pray that you will guide us and lead us to a closer relationship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. So what is the prosperity gospel? It claims that God wants Christians to be healthy and wealthy, and if they are not, they just need more faith, or maybe they haven't invested in the right ministry, so you know, send your check to the number that's on the screen, right? And then things are going to go better for you, and God's going to bless you. And so the prosperity gospel claims that God is obligated to deliver to you. So if you have the faith, he delivers. And if you are doing what you're supposed to do, God is required to answer this. And here's the interesting thing. At nearly every heresy, and yes, I'm going to call the prosperity gospel a heresy because it is, is tied to a legitimate truth in Scripture. Every heresy, all, every cult uh, that's, that's somewhat Bible-centered is tied to a certain verse or a certain way of thinking from a passage. And so there's some truth there that's been distorted. And so what truth is being distorted that they would run, they, that would, the prosperity people would run and think that God just wants us all to be healthy and wealthy? Well, verse 6 does seem very clear, the fact that whoever sows sparingly reaps sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. So the Bible does teach that God rewards faithful giving, plain and simple. He rewards faithful giving. But what is he referring to? Our text itself gives a great explanation. Look in verse 8. Skip to verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every rich thing, right? No. What's he say? Every good work. So God's purpose in blessing the generous person is so that we, they will abound in every good work that God is going to pour out on them, not for their own selfish riches and their purposes they want to achieve in life, but it's so that they can accomplish every good work that God leads them and guides them to. And he reinforces this again, verse 11. Skip down to verse 11. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will provide thanksgiving to God. So Paul says that in their offering that they're given to help the poor Jewish Christians, giving will, will be rewarded so they can continue to be generous in every way. So again, this is not the rich guy who Jesus condemned who said, wow, look how much blessing I have, right? And so he sits back in his comfort and he says to himself, I have plenty of things laid up for many years. Take it easy, drink, eat, be merry, right? So that is the, the angle that so many take with the prosperity gospel, that it's about me and my luxury, my materialism, what I can get out of this. And that's why it's such a disaster to see pastors who peddle this stuff living in the, such a high life, the big mansions, the jets, and all claiming that's because God's blessing them for their ministries. And so Paul wants to be clear that this is about spiritual blessings and money, the, the, what we do with our money, is a result of the spiritual blessing that God's pouring out that we can be more generous and share in more ways and make a bigger impact for his kingdom. And so the benefit received back, the harvest, may be money, 
But the real harvest here is the spiritual growth that happens for God's glory. The spiritual growth that happens for God's glory. I mentioned this last week. I talked to so many of you during this Growing Grace campaign, the benefits spiritually that have happened in your own life. Because it's been a very tough, soul-searching endeavor to really say, God, what do you want for me? What do you want me to give? We're going to talk more about that in just a second. But Paul's illustration here, he uses an illustration of agriculture. And he says very simply, the more that you sow, the more you get in return. And if you're stingy and you're taking one seed and you're throwing one seed out occasionally here and there, what's going to happen? You're going to get very little back in return. And so God gives us money so that we can be more generous for his purposes. And money and giving become more than just an exchange. It becomes evidence of the love given in Jesus' name. So we illustrate our love for Jesus and our commitment through to Jesus. And so if we sow a life of stinginess, of selfishness, materialism, the harvest we experience will be perfectly in keeping to the seeds that we've planted. If you sow for yourself, you're going to reap for yourself. If you sow for God and his kingdom, you're going to reap a generous spiritual reward. Money oftentimes is the part of that. But the main key is the spiritual growth that we have so we can be a better illustration for Jesus Christ on this earth and make him known. It's not for our comfort and our ease and our prosperity. So giving back from the right heart will always come back to us in spiritual blessings. God's grace enables us to thrive in this way of living generously and just making him known through a life that portrays the gospel. So what is the right heart for giving? Look at verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. So Paul's helping the Corinthians really adopt this new worldview here, right? I mean, in their day, very much like ours, it was about what you can get, what you can take, how big you can make yourself. And so he's introducing them to the way of Jesus Christ. He wants them to live their life and go through their world in the city of Corinth and for us today to go through our life in the United States of America, the most prosperous nation that's ever been in the history of the world. He wants us to live our lives in a way that we represent Jesus through our generosity and through our cheerful giving. And it's so countercultural to everything. And sadly, many churches, and maybe you weren't raised in a prosperity gospel. I think that's probably less than the ones that would, I would address in this verse, the ones where God says, give according to have you decided in your heart. A lot of us grew up in churches where it was very much the law. It was the Mosaic law. It was give X percent. I, I sat through many stewardship banquets where it, you know, things like you can't give, out give God, and if you give 10% to him, he's going to just open the windows of heaven and pour out his blessing. And it very much was a soft prosperity gospel. And you know, that's easier, honestly. Like when, when you're raised in a tradition where it's like give X percent, then you just give X percent, right? You just follow the law. And some of you love following law. I mean, you thrive on rules. For others, you know, it, it's not cheerful. It's like paying your taxes, right? There's nothing cheerful about this because it's forced upon you. And you'd much rather give out of generosity than to get to be forced. Well, that's what when you look back and you follow the law and you start trying to make it be a, a certain percentage of your giving, you miss out on the entire tone of the new covenant Paul is setting here. And it's tough. As I said a minute ago, it's tough to really process verse 7. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart. This is a spiritual journey most of the time. Of course, there's times where we can give. If somebody asks us for money, we can turn around and give them a $10 bill. That's not a big sacrifice for most of us. But it's usually a process when it comes to really sacrificial giving, as Paul is calling them to. And look, if you're, if you're newer to the whole giving to church thing and giving for God's kingdom, like any percent of your income is a radical shot because you're probably just like me. You've got everything in your budget is given to some sort of line item, right? you got everything covered, and so there ain't a lot of cushion there. 
But the amazing thing begins to happen as you process and begin to look at and analyze, as many of you have done, praise God, in so many incredible stories I've heard over the last weeks, and you have done, many of you, throughout your lifetime by being sacrificial givers to the church, that this process involves prayer and involves wisdom and it involves the church community encouraging one another. It involves listening to the Holy Spirit. That's tough because we don't want sometimes to hear from God. Give me the law. Tell me the amount. Give me the bill, right? But not leave this up to me. But you see, God begins to work in us. And we become very dependent upon him. And we look and we say, what needs to change in my life? What needs to change in my priorities so that I can contribute, so I can make a difference for God's kingdom, so I can be a generous person in the way that I use what God has given to me for the purpose of sharing his love and his worth in his kingdom. You see, that's a radical worldview change for many of you, just like it was for the Corinthians. Because naturally, in our humanness, even as believers, in our flesh, we want to be satisfied, we want to be secure, we want to have it easy, we want to have it comfortable. But God causes us to be put out of our comfort zones when it comes to this endeavor, to this process of each one must give as he has decided in his heart. That's tough stuff. And again, this is definitely not law. It's just church wisdom. It's, it's community wisdom. I love this quote by C.S. Lewis as he talked about this and, and dealt with this. He, he wrote this. He said, I do not believe one can settle how much we ought to give. I am afraid the only safe rule is to give more than we can spare. In other words, if our expenditure on comforts, luxuries, amusement, etc., is up to the standard common among those with the same income as our own, we are probably giving away too little. If our giving does not at all pinch or hamper us, I would say it is too small. There ought to be things we should like to do and cannot because our commitment to giving excludes them. That's a really a lot of wisdom packed into that quote there. And I, I think that's where we've, as a church, have kind of journeyed over these weeks to, God, what do you want us to do? And praise God where we landed as a church. Amazing. I mean, it, it's so awesome to see the way God worked in our hearts through this process. And God continues to work because he pours out his grace upon us. And that's where Paul goes next in verse 8. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. This is about as close to a promise when it's connected to our giving that you'll find in Scripture. But again, this is not a promise that we'll have all the money that we'll want, but we will have all the money we need to be generous, gracious, and loving people for God's glory. So God's grace, he says, is available he makes us sufficient at all times. I think of Paul's words in Philippians where he says he's going to be content in every situation. God is giving the ability to do that. I can be content with a little or I can be content with a lot. We can share with others. We can make a difference. God can work in our lives. And we become people who just live this life of generosity. The Corinthians, as they walked through the city of Corinth in the first century, if they were generous people as God has called them to be, people in their community would take note. They would be like, whoa, they're different, right? Something strange about that person. But as Keller mentioned in his prayer up here about Jesus and turning the other cheek and all the things that, that Jesus um, said would be different about those of us who put our faith into Jesus Christ, definitely our giving, our generosity, our commitment to other people is different than the world. And it, it, it's clearly different by the standards that the world sets. And so while giving to growing grace is amazing, and many of you, again, have made sacrificial commitments, let's not forget the little ways that we have the ability to give and to contribute in our community. One I think about is our K-groups. We say that our K-groups are where we care for other people. That's our time we rally around others when they're hurting, when 
they're, they have a baby and they're celebrating when all these things, changes happen in their life. They need care and they need us to rally around them. And small groups gives the ability to do that. And many of your groups, all your groups, probably have set up meal trains from time to time to care for those in need. And some groups do better than this at others, but oftentimes some groups struggle with just filling up three or four meals on their care plan because it's somebody else's job. It's not my job to do. Other people have more time, more money, more, money, more energy to do that. And it's sad because a lot of times some of your groups will have to look outside your group to other groups in order to help fill those spots. That should not be the case. That's a very simple I, and I would say inexpensive sacrifice in order to encourage and build up one another in love. And what did Jesus say? It's by our love for one another that you will know. They'll know that you're my disciples by your love for one another. And so it's through our love for one another, through very small, tangible ways oftentimes, that we make a difference and we're different than the world. We're countercultural. And then next verse, verse 9, Paul quotes Psalm 112, 9, to illustrate the lasting results of generosity when it's done with the right heart, that these things create a reputation. They create a ripple effect. Look at verse 9. He says, as, as it is written, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. And I believe his righteousness there refers to the righteous act of the person who's responding to what God's asked them to do. So when we're gracious and generous for God's kingdom and his glory, we reveal the righteousness and the generosity of God. And you don't think about that. You don't think about when you sign up for a mill train, you don't think usually, oh, I'm spreading the generosity and grace of God in this situation. But that's what you're doing. In that small little sacrifice that you're making, you are being the hands and feet of Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is not going to come down here and provide the meal for you. He's not going to drop manna from heaven for the family so you can sit at home and watch your favorite show. He is going to call you and me to get up and to make an effort and do something in order to him to be revealed and show God is gracious and loving and generous. And so that's what Paul was saying. And he's saying this reward, this blessing will be for today and it will go on for all of eternity. In verse 10 then, he says, he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food, and this is a quote from the Old Testament, will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. And then he adds something new, a new twist here which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. And so he introduces this concept how that others um, that, that are giving becomes a form of thanksgiving to God and others will give praise and glory through this offering that they're giving. And I think also about Paul's words in Galatians when Paul talked about his own testimony and he talked about his conversion and he laid that out for them and then he said this at the end. He said, In verse 24, he said, and they glorify God in me. Paul says that they glorify God in me. And I know it's kind of a bold statement to make for us, right? But God receives glory through us. God receives glory through our generosity. And so in this context, he's saying because of the generous and sacrificial gift administered by Paul, the Jerusalem saints would say, praise be to God. Praise God for this offering that's come in to help us. God is glorified when we give toward his kingdom with the right heart, a cheerful giver. One thing that I think is oftentimes I see, and I'm guilty of it, I see it in my own life, I can see it in others, is this desire for us to receive maybe a fraction of the glory with our giving you know, we, we, especially those who really are sacrificial or give large amounts, we can be very tempted to want other people to know kind of where we were giving and what our level of giving is. And that's one thing I want to really add and just say again and again, this church, we're, we're so confidential with the money that you give, growing grace, your regular giving and offering. We don't know. I tell you, if, if I knew who the big givers were, 
I would probably treat you better than other people. And that's sad, right? But that's the flesh that kind of wells up and the, the wealthy person comes in. You say, sit here at the front. That's a danger because James addressed that. Sit here, have this good seat. Oh, the poor person, okay, you, you're in the back. You're like, we don't really have much time for you. And so it's so important that we honor Jesus' words when he said in Matthew, but when you give to someone in need, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. He's like, be confidential. Be, don't, don't let people know. Don't proclaim this. Be very careful with the way that you present yourself when it comes to giving because we all have this tendency and we all have these struggles with these mixed motivations. And, and sometimes in my lifetime being in church for many, many years and yours as well, you've known people who've given large amounts of money to a ministry and later on you see them totally drift away from the faith. And so what was their motive? Sometimes we don't know what's going on. Motives can be tricky. It can be difficult. Uh, years ago, I came across this news story, kind of, kind of a funny illustration. Came across this news story. What I do when I see funny stuff in the news and I see things that are interesting, I'll put them in a file on my computer, and then when I have a sermon on a certain topic, I'll go back and look through to see if there's any illustrations that match up. Well, I came across this past week, I came across a story that I saved years ago about a guy named Jeffrey Manchester. And interestingly enough, I saw that like current this week, like they're making a movie about this story. And in a way, it's kind of sad because the guy doesn't deserve to be glorified because of his behavior. But it, and nevertheless, it's an interesting story of deception where this Jeffrey Manchester was known as this generous church-going volunteer named John, and he loved to give toys away to kids in the church. All right, so he would come to church with toys and be ha- passing them out. Man, this guy's great. He's amazing. Starts dating a single mom in the church. You know, he's really taken in. He's all part of it. Come to find out, old Jeffrey is a fugitive from justice. And get this, he's hiding out in a Toys R Us. All right? So no wonder he's passing around toys to kids, right? He's hiding in this cubby hole in the bicycle display. He spends his nights riding bikes around the aisles for exercises, sex size, and eats baby food to help him, you know, in his nourishment, Right? And he was ultimately caught by two members of the Crossroads Presbyterian Church who recognized police photos of him when, because he joined the church back in October of that year. And so, giving away stolen toys, right? And so, there's lots of ways that we can have these mixed motives. We give to get, kind of the prosperity thing. Some of us, like, we, we just hold back and we rob God, and we give, uh, we give to get attention from other people, to get recognition from other people. But Paul builds on this idea of thanksgiving to God in these last four verses for a reason. It all comes back to Jesus Christ. We're going to kind of just cover 12 through 15 as one group here. He says this. Let me read it again. For the ministry of this service, this gift, this offering, is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings, to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. So notice how Paul wraps this section up. He doesn't say, thank you for your gift. He says, thanks be to God for his inexpressible gift. Because he, again, comes back to the fact that it all comes from God. And talking about a worldview change for the Corinthians and for us, we don't think of it that way, like it all comes from him. And so he instead directs them to God, who is the giver of good and perfect gifts. And I really think, ultimately, as he speaks of the gospel back in verse 13, the gospel of Christ, this really points back to the last chapter and really the key verse in these entire two chapters, which is chapter 8, verse 9. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. Paul, in essence, is saying this whole thing is all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. It's all about God's glory. And you remember I talked about early on how the fact that 
Paul really wanted to make a statement. While the Jews in Jerusalem were suffering, and they were, there was a famine, and they were starving, this, more than that, was about the gospel, and it was about saying that the gospel changes the Gentiles' hearts. It really changes people. This gospel message, Jesus Christ and him in us, and the Spirit, as Jesus said in John chapter 7, who comes to reside within us, and out of our innermost being, Jesus said, will flow rivers of living water. And what was he talking about? He's talking about the Holy Spirit just pouring out just a generous and gracious way of living. And, and obviously, that's a progressive way of growing and becoming more like Christ. But the image is there very clear for us today, and it was there for the Corinthians, that God takes people who are very selfish and self-centered and all about themselves and their comfort and their wealth, and he takes us and he pours in his spirit within us. And he changes us through his word and through truth, and we begin to just be people who are just gracious and generous to other people with our time, with our treasure, with our talents. We just become generous in all of these ways. And it's all about this gospel message that Paul wanted the, the Jerusalem church to see. The gospel really changes people. This new covenant, there's a major change that's happened. While the Mosaic covenant, it was great and it was wonderful, something way more glorious has happened. And Jesus came, and he lived, and he died, and he was a sacrifice, and he rose again, proving he was who he said he was. And now we celebrate a new covenant. We celebrate God living within us and changing us. And, and so much of that change is now the fact that we are people who display what Jesus displayed. Though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that by, your, by his poverty you might be rich. And so he takes us and he uses us and what we bring to the table, which is his anyway, and we scatter it out and God blesses and it becomes a greater and greater harvest for his glory because the gospel has truly changed us. And the only way for this to happen, the only way we can take giving and not look at it like subtraction, but we see it as multiplication where God is just multiplying that seed, the only way that is going to happen in our life is truth and Jesus. We have to marinate. We have to set in it. We have to allow Jesus just to, and his truth just to be a part of every area of our life. And we've got to slow down our hurried lives and we got to be with Jesus and set with Jesus. And at his feet, we need to be like Mary and not Martha. While serving is wonderful and it's good, you need to be still and be with Jesus. You need to talk to Jesus throughout the day, throughout the weeks. Because those weeks turn to months and years and decades. And pretty soon, you're looking back and you're saying, I wish I would have done it differently. So Jesus, it's all about him. And he changes us from the inside out. And that's the beauty of the new covenant. It's for his glory, and it's for our good. So being a generous person is a mark of genuine love in the likeness of Jesus. Being a generous person is a mark of genuine love in the likeness of Jesus. And people who are obsessed with Jesus give freely. They do. As we take the Lord's Supper today, I hope that you'll reflect upon Jesus Reflect upon the sacrifice that he made for you. And that he became poor so that you could have the richness of eternal life that starts now and begins now. And you can live life differently than our culture. And may I say in this season of election where everybody's angry and bitter and, and pointing fingers and yelling and screaming, that generosity is also shown in a lot more ways than just the offering that we give. It's shown through a life that's much more giving and sacrificial and loving and gracious than the culture around us. And we need each other for that, for gracious living, not just gracious giving, gracious living, prayer, wisdom, accountability, community. We need all those things. And we need the cup and the bread to remind us. Let's pray. Father God, your word is truth, and we need truth in a culture that at some level Satan is able to plant lies and sow lies and create chaos. And it can work its way into churches, and we know that's true, not in, only in the world, but just even in our city. God, we see the chaos that happens. And God, I pray that you'll help us to stay anchored to Jesus and to the Word and never stray away. And God, as we stay anchored, not just in intellectual truth, 
but in, in a lifestyle that embraces a, a true and living and real relationship with you that makes you a priority. Out of that may flow generous and gracious living. And we thank you for Grace Church, and we thank you for the way you're working in people's hearts and how we've seen evidence of that over these last weeks. And God, we want to be generous people that, that give the gospel and make the gospel known through our lives and through our words. In Jesus' name.